this morning, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 through 44. John chapter 11, John writes this, A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. After two days, he said to his disciples, let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Jesus answered, aren't there 12 hours in the day? Whoever walks in the day doesn't stumble because they see the light of the world. But whoever walks in the night does stumble because the light isn't in them. He continued, our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going in order to wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get well. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was in a deep sleep, but Jesus had spoken about Lazarus' death. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. For your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. Let's go to him. Then Thomas, the one they called Didymus, said to the other disciples, Let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, the one who is coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn at the tomb. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them said, he healed the eyes of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him 
and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. And let us pray. Dear Lord, we have we've read your word and we've gathered together to worship you. The studying is done, the, the preparation is finished. The time has come for us to, to listen intently, to lean in, and to hear you speak. So Lord, as I stand here this morning with all sorts of thoughts running through my head about this passage of Scripture after studying and, and thinking and praying, I simply ask that, that when I speak this morning, it be your words that come out of my mouth. So that we can hear what you have for us through your word. I pray that you hide me behind your cross so that your glory, honor, and strength may be seen and experienced in a transforming and miraculous way. We pray all this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. It, it was interesting. As I was doing a lot of studying this week and, and the last couple of weeks on this passage of scripture, one of the things that I noticed is everyone wants to debate. Uh, all the scholars and, and everybody that's writing commentary on this, what they always seem to want to be debating is whether or not Lazarus was actually raised from the tomb. Uh, and the reason they want to debate this is because this is the only place in scripture where this story takes place. And, and so there are some people who think that, well, if, if Luke shared it and John shared it, then that gives it more validity or, or, you know, this and that. And then they also point out that Luke shares a story about a Lazarus, but that's a parable. And so that, so some people have argued that maybe perhaps John is actually just using a parable and, and he's actually trying to make it a real life experience. Um, I, for one, don't see any reason to believe that this is less valid than any of the other miracles that we read about in scripture. But one of the things that I as I was reading this week, really, it really hit home, it really dawned on me, is that really the story that we read in the last little bit, the, the couple last verses of this, about Lazarus actually being raised, that's secondary. Because that simply is an illustration of the theology that we read in verses 25 and 26. And so let me go back and read 25 and 26 again here, real quick. Jesus said to her, remember, he's, he's talking to Martha at this point. Martha's come out, and he's talking to Martha, and he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? That right there is really the most important part of this entire story. Everything that takes place, everything that's going on, the conversations that are happening, this is the pivotal point of this story. His statement of who he is, and then his question, do you believe it? Martha, do you believe this? Now it's interesting, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. By using the imagery of resurrection and life, what he is, in essence, is doing is he is associating himself with God. What he's saying is that he's looking at her basically and saying, God and I are one. Because for the people, resurrection, life, that is God. God is a God of life and resurrection. He is not a God of death and burial and the end of things. He is the, he is the beginning of things. And, and, and he wants to see something start and something go through eternity. And so when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am life, in essence what he's saying to Martha right there and to us that are reading it, he's saying, I am one with God. It's an I am statement, which in the Bible simply means it's, it's a God statement. It is an I am. Who is God? God is I am. And so when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am life, that's what he's saying. Now, as we read through the Gospel of John, it's very important for us to understand that the way John begins his Gospel, when he begins to describe Jesus, is he says this, Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things that came into being came in through this Word. And so what does it mean for Jesus to be the Word of God? 
it's really important for us to begin to sort of work through some of these things because what he's asking Martha is, this, what he does is he says, this is who I am. Do you believe this? In other words, he's asking Martha, who do you believe that I am? And he asks us this exact same question. He says, who is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? So for John, we see he is, he is the word of God. He is the resurrection. He is the life. What, in essence, he's saying when he starts calling Jesus the word is he starts saying that, that God has revealed himself in who Jesus is. And so when Jesus says, do you believe that this is who I am? It's not about necessarily a belief in, in theological statements. It's a belief in the person of Jesus. It's a belief in the relationship between Jesus and God. That's what faith is about. That's what belief is about. It doesn't mean that I can stand here and say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I mean, these are the answers that Martha gives, and they're not wrong answers. But he, she looks at him and she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, and the one who is coming into the world. And so, so for us, we can read that and we can think, okay, there's this concept where there has to be sort of this intellectual ascent. But it's not about that. It's more a belief about who the person is of Jesus. When you say he's your savior, what does that mean? Who is the savior in relationship to God and how does that work? So go back to the idea that he is the word of God. So in other words, what happens is how do we communicate with each other? Well, we, we speak to each other. We write to each other. You know, I mean, of course, even, even emails and tweet, uh, what is it, Twitter, right? And, and Facebook, even, that's even writing. And so we write to communicate with one another. And so what we understand is that Jesus is the communication of God. Isn't Jesus also called the truth? And so what it is, is it's not necessarily... Uh, beginning to get your mind wrapped around something. It's beginning to believe in Jesus. And what is Jesus communicating? He's communicating that he is life. He is resurrection. He is, he is love. He's power over death. Do we believe that? Do we believe what we see in Jesus is true about God? Do we believe that God wants us to live fully? Do we believe that God wants us to be resurrected in our lives? Do we believe that God loves us the way we see Jesus love others? That's what it means to believe in Jesus. It means that you believe the things that you see in Jesus. That you believe that they're true when we begin to talk about God. Do you believe in Jesus? It doesn't mean, yes, that I believe that he's my savior. It means, do you believe that God wants you to be saved? And so he looks at Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and I am life. And he says, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And so what he's saying here in essence is this, that even though your body may die, you yourself are ever, forever going to live. And so then you begin to ask that question and you begin to say, so are you living as if you will never die? Because in essence, that's really what's going to happen. God is a God of life and living. He's not about death. It's interesting. The only time, you go to a funeral, and I know I, I do it I, all the time. It's actually part of our liturgy in the United Methodist Book of Worship. But this idea of I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. And we read this at funerals and, we, and it gives us assurance for those that have passed. But we never see the implication for the life. He's not speaking this to Lazarus. He's speaking it to Martha. This isn't just an assurance of that someday when I die, I'll end up with God. It's a statement about living with God right now. Living with the belief that I will live forever. If you, were, if you knew that you were going to live forever, how would it change the way you live today? We talk about Jesus having power over sin and death. What is the power of death? Have you ever thought about that? Some, some say, well, the power of death means it means it ends everything. But I think this. I think the power of death is fear. 
we're afraid of death. And then we begin to ask, when we start to follow Christ, and we begin to believe in Christ, which means I believe that God loves me, I believe that God wants me to live forever, then we can start asking the question, oh, death, where is your sting? In other words, where is your power? I'm not afraid of you. And if I'm not afraid of death, now I can really begin to live. Do we live our lives as those who will never die? Or do we live our lives afraid that someday we will? That's what he's asking us. And then when he gets to, the, and then when he gets to actually to the point where he begins to speak and, re, and, and Lazarus is resurrected, we begin, to see, we begin to see the implications of what Jesus is talking about. It's interesting because she has a very good statement of faith. I mean, to read this, if I were to ask somebody, you know, who is Jesus to you? And they looked at me and they said, he is the Christ, he is God's son, and he's the one coming into the world. I would think that's a very, very good answer. That's a very good answer. And now for some of us in, in the church, some of us in the Christian community, we think that the important thing is that you get that answer right so that when you die, you may live. But the point is, do you understand who it is now so that you can live and never die? Are you following me so far? And so we begin to see Martha is the one that gets asked this question. Then we jump down to verse 39. Right? And so Martha, she gets it. She's got the right statement. She even said to Jesus, she even said to Jesus you know, that if you would have been here, he could have lived. And so she understands the power of Jesus. And she even sort of understands this idea of having power over death and that you know, you, he could resurrect and things like that. And, and, and she begins to understand that. But it, when we get to verse 39, we begin to see that for her, it still has everything to do with that someday. And it doesn't have a whole lot to do with right now. Because um, as Jesus is, is going, over there and he says, okay, um, remove the stone. Verse 39. Jesus says, remove the stone. It's Martha who speaks up and says, uh, uh, wait a minute. It, it, Lord, uh, the smell's going to be awful. He's been dead four days. And so you see with Martha, yeah, I get it. I got it, but I can't apply it right now because as far as I can see, he is dead. There's no application for the life now. How many of us walk through and we might be able to say the right things about Jesus, but we really don't know what, even what it is we're saying because we can't apply it to the way we live today. And so when we say, yes, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, and then something comes into our life and we're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, you don't do that, Lord, that stinks. I think, I think though, the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, and I stand before you here as part of, part of what I'm talking about, is that in the church we have a tendency to fall into the same trap that Martha herself has fallen into. This idea of an understanding of the power of God, uh, but, but uh, uh, maybe um, sort of hedging our bets when it comes to actually watching it in our lives. In the church we, we have... It's interesting because Jesus comes along, right? And you look at the religious establishment at the time, and I forget how many laws there were. I want to say it's like 617, maybe. Not just the ones that, that, that Jesus or that God gave Moses, but on top of that, there was a lot of laws because you don't want to accidentally break a law, right? And so you have all these laws. And then Jesus comes along and he's asked, what are the two most important laws? You know, what, what's the most important law? And he says, to love God, then love your neighbor as you, as you would love yourself. And so he basically says, you know, really there's only two. And then if you were to ask somebody today in the church, in the people of God, in, in our religion, what, you know, what, what are some of your laws? We may start going through some polity. You know, because you, you want to make sure that you're living a certain way because... And so what happens is, a lot of times in our church, we get so caught up in our rules and our regulations that we actually begin to tie people up and not allow them to live. Because we want to tell people, well, this is right or this is wrong, and this is, how you, this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do. And if you do that, well, then you're a Christian, but if you do that, then you're not. And if you want to be part of our church, then you have to do this, or you, or you have to do that, otherwise you're not part of the church. And we begin to think that the church is somehow a voluntary 
organization, right? Like there's this, like, you know, you don't have to be part of this. And actually that's not the way it works at all. What God says, everybody's part of this. And so while God's trying to blow the doors wide open, we're trying to say, yes, that's good, but... And so we join right in with Martha, that yes, Jesus, I believe that, but don't open that door. And the whole time Jesus is saying, no, it's about living. It's not about preparing for a death. It's about living as if there never will be one. So how much of our focus is on that when I die... I can go to the great by and by rather than beginning to live as if I never will die and that the great by and by is just a continuation of the life I'm currently living. This morning, I want to ask a question and I want you to seriously think about it. And, and, and I, I'm not looking for hands, I'm not looking for a response, but I, I want to ask you this. Is Christ in your life freeing you up to live? And to live fully. Or when you start to think about your faith, you begin to think of the way it binds you. I have friends, I know I've shared this before, but I have friends that tell me they don't want to become a Christian because they enjoy life too much. And my thought is if you want to enjoy life more, become a Christian. I want to, I want to point one last thing out. What is the last command? I think sometimes we miss this. The last command that God, through Jesus Christ, gives in this story. This is it. The last word that Jesus has to say before the story moves on. He says this. Untie him and let him go. Untie him and let him go. That's what Jesus is about. Removing the ties that bind us, that keep us down, and letting us go. Begin to live. There are some scholars... And I'm not sure. I'm kind of on the fence on this. There are some scholars who argue that the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John is actually Lazarus. It's not, it's not John. And they point to this passage of Scripture, and because there's no mention of the beloved disciple before chapter 11. After chapter 11, all of a sudden there's this beloved disciple. And in this, when they tell Jesus that Lazarus, when the message gets to, La to Jesus about Lazarus being sick, what does it say? It says, the one that you love. And all of a sudden, there's this beloved disciple. And so, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. I grew up in a way that, that I was taught that that was John, and that's a very hard thing for me to shake. But it's interesting to consider, what if it was Lazarus? We begin to see, I mean, actually, when, when Jesus has his triumphal entry, everyone comes running out because they've heard the stories about Lazarus, and they want to see what's going on. And so there are some that came as much to see Lazarus as they did to come to see Jesus, because this is a guy that he's raised from the dead. But what's even more striking is, who has the courage to not worry about their own life, but to stand at the foot of the cross? Who has the courage to go all the way to the cross with Jesus? It's that beloved disciple. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that that might be Lazarus? Because after all, if you've already been killed, you've been raised from the dead, you've experienced resurrection, you're not really that afraid of dying again. Brothers and sisters in Christ, have we experienced, finally maybe, a death so that we can be resurrected? As some like to say, born again? Do we really believe when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am life and I have power? Power greater than the power of sin and death. So that you may live are we willing to hear Jesus say to us, be untied and go?
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.